Hello and welcome back to SuperCloud 7 where we're really unpacking what's going on in the data platform, looking forward to the next data platform and how you're going to actually build those applications on top of those apps and the data and bringing it all together. And I, I think really what we have is a fantastic crew that's going to be joining us here. Uh, we have two great people from Kubia. We have Amit, who's here, and we have Shaked, who's here. And then we have Debo, who's here from Nutanix. And again, I think when you look at it, you're the VP of engineering over at Nutanix, CTO at Kubia, and you're the head of Kubia, right? So CEO and all of that. So well, let's jump into it. And most importantly, I'm joined by fantastic Savannah Peterson, who's going to help me unpack this today. And, what what are you thinking about when you look at this group that we have here and what we're talking about today? I'm really excited. First of all, I mean, we've had Kibia on the show many times in the few moments that I was talking to Debo about Nutanix and just his 20 years of experience in AI. I know that we are going to learn a lot from our next guest. So I'm pumped, Rob, and thrilled to be on stage here with you. It's our first super cloud together. In the this is, show. this is, and, and I think what's, fun about this is we, we did some research with our partner ETR and one of the things that we found was that not only were people and we surveyed over a hundred uh, joint Databricks and Snowflake customers and part of what we designed into it was to understand how fast are they moving to cloud, what are some of the you know pitfalls that they're running into because what we see in some of the other data is people are trying to get ROI out of AI and right now, it's how do I do more with less because the cost of that and seeing that is going up. So I, I think, again, just, you know, let's, let me open with Debo. And you guys, again, not a natural fit. People, when they think super cloud and they think AI, maybe they don't think Nutanix. Help people understand, again, you know, what types of workloads and AI is happening on Nutanix these days. Yeah, that's a very good question. So uh, when people think of Nutanix, they think of us as cloud, private cloud architecture. We are morphing from hyper-converged to private cloud to managing data and data governance for our customers and enabling um, basically cloud-native applications, including AI and generative AI. So if you look at what's happening in AI today, we are kind of at the cusp of uh, you know, digital intelligence surpassing biological intelligence. People are debating about it. It's not about if, it's about when. So when you now uh, drill that down into enterprise, you see a lot of use cases. Um, so everybody wants to run their customer support bot automatically. They want to use AI to g run faster. Whether it's code generation, whether it's uh, productivity, whether it's, you know, SRE, DevOps. So we see our customers wanting to run a lot of generative AI applications on uh, premises and in hybrid mode. So that's where we come in uh, and we have a, uh, you know, a, a thing called GPT in a box, a solution uh, that's in its uh, first generation and the second generation has been announced to help customers run really generative AI applications really quickly and efficiently with the governance and data protection and so on and so forth. I feel like everybody wants a GPT in a box at this stage right now. <laughs> everybody wants an easy button. Easy they button. want, yeah, I, I can imagine that's a popular <laughs> offering for you. There's, we're, we're at a really interesting and exciting time. You talk about everybody wanting the same things. We've been talking about AI for DevOps, everybody probably wanting a lot of the same things. Oh yeah. I think everyone on this stage is obsessed with the developer experience. I know that it's something that we share. And I mean, I'm going to turn it to you next. You said something while we were hanging out in the back. <laughs> before this in our pseudo green room that really immediately stuck out with me. And you said that delegation is the new automation. What does that mean? <laughs> perfect. You set it up perfectly, Savannah. Uh, so let's, let's take one, one step back. We are thinking there's a new form factor that needs to be indoctrinated for the world of automation. It's no longer simply enough to have automation as, a, as kind of a steady state, right? There's... Yeah. Um, a paradox called the time to automation paradox. Now, that loosely states the time and effort it takes you to configure a file, a YAML configuration file, yeah. go down the list, uh, Terraform landing zone, or so forth. The time and the effort that it takes to, 
to write it up and to maintain it and to look into all the inner aspects of it and to make sure it's fully functional and production grade versus the output that you receive isn't always correlated to each other. Yeah. Oftentimes you'll see organizations stand up a self-service platform, an internal developer portal. You can name all the different flavors of these different uh, portals. At the end of the day, it's, it's output versus input and it doesn't always have the economics involved. So how we're thinking about this is take a step back. What are you actually trying to achieve? Let's talk about the outcome you're trying to achieve. The outcome you're trying to achieve is take this role or take this task off my plate, put it in somebody else's shoes or offload it from me because mm -hmm. I want to work, right? That's mm -hmm. the developer experience we're looking for. So as far as you're concerned as an end user, you don't care if it's an offshore team that's taking off your plate, or if it's Bob on the on-call uh, channel, or if it's a virtual Bob, in this case, right, doing it on your right. behalf. <clears throat> if you could go and abstract away, what we're actually saying is delegate that chore, that task, that process from me into the hands of a trusted teammate mm -hmm. or a trusted uh, colleague, mm -hmm. and then make sure that happens. And that's essentially the experience we're trying to cut, where the form factor changed from automation to delegation. I love that, you just described that really well. Thank you. Is that resounding in your community when you're explaining this to people? Is everybody ready? They should be. <laughs> <If you're not. laughs> That's a good one. Yeah. Yeah. I, think, I think they are. Uh, Shakita, I want to come to you. You know, this is a really interesting m moment and, and, and the, in, you know, AI for DevOps, more important now than ever. Why is this such a unique moment? So, Essentially, in the era, um, in the evolution of how DevOps came to be, mm -hmm. uh, we were always trying to delegate. Okay? We were trying to delegate to machines, mm -hmm. and we were trying to do that using concepts like CICD, right, which took to the industry a lot of time to adapt. Even now, it's still hard to adapt CICD, and also infrastructure as code, right, uh, solutions like Pulumi, Terraform yeah. that combines the infrastructure element <coughs> and how to essentially um, bind the glues together in order to get an end-to-end solution combined between the two worlds um, of development and uh, operations. And essentially, the way we see it is that we're now just entering another phase in this revolution. This phase is now enabled uh, because of the fact that large language models allows to take off uh, the abstraction, the complexity layer of knowing how to get to these automations, understanding mm -hmm. the CICD processes um, or these uh, kind of uh, collaborative processes that's combining between what's up happening with uh, the humans and the machines. So today something that is missing to anyone in CICD could be as simple as notifications. People struggle to get a notification of what's going on with some pipeline. Mm -hmm. It's as that with the revolution of large language models and the ability to make things really predictable, which is the hard part. Uh, you need to think about how to do the infrastructure very stateless. You need to uh, find the perfect way to combine um, all of the infrastructure elements to get the delegation part that Amit uh, was talking about. Um, the way we see it is we provide a solution rather than uh, a platform. Um, and this solution allows you to really offload these tasks off you, but in a way you can trust. Same way you will trust CICD and uh, ISC processes, which are already trusted and proved, proven to be uh, uh, the good uh, way of approaching this kind of uh, thing. Yeah, and I, I would say that, again, from the developers developing you know, infrastructure as code, then it comes down and it has to be able to be deployed yes, and right. things of that nature. <clears throat> and it has to be able to be you know, backwards and forwards. And I, I think to your point, there's what we see in, in the data that we see, there's a lot of skills gap oh, as yeah. well. And I, I think that's where both companies are focused on the easy button, I guess you could say, right. for bringing this infrastructure together. Do you, do you see that as you're building your products out, the Nutanix products out, how you're building up into those stacks or building APIs and things of that layer so that others can make that easy as well at the app dev layer? Is that what you focus on? Yes, so um, we are doing this in two different ways. One is we want to first help our customers run models very efficiently because it's part of the MLOps 
um, uh, life cycle for them. So if you look, think about how an uh, enterprise company will um, you know, deploy a chatbot. A chatbot has multiple components, and uh, you know, they'll use an um, SRE uh, tool ecos tooling ecosystem, but at the end of the day, if they're using an LLM-based tooling system, they will want to run a model or two. And now that model has to be uh, you know, you know, kind of served in a robust way. It has to ensure, uh, it, you know, you have to ensure that you know you can monitor the model. Something goes wrong, so that part we are trying to make it very easy by helping customers just run model inference. So our GPT in a box will help you run um, large language models with you know um, connectors to Hugging Face Hub and Nvidia Nims uh, Nims Hub, so that customers can then run the model of their choice. And that's one part of it. And also, we are big believers in open source, so we have actually contributed a lot to MLOps platforms, which because we see that SREs and developers love open source, so we are big contributors to uh, Kubeflow, which is the dominant MLOps platform. We are also contributing to ML standards, uh, like ML Commons, and uh, so on and so forth. So we, it's a two-pronged strategy. Help customers uh, with simplified infrastructure, and also enable the developer ecosystem with uh, open source goodies. You mentioned ML Commons. You recently just had a milestone. Yeah. Can you tell us about that? So um, <coughs> ML Commons j just announced their um, big AI safety initiative. That's one of the biggest milestones, a uh, shift that's happening. So ML Commons started off as an infrastructure um, you know, benchmarking organization. Then it evolved to the best practices one and uh, building new data sets, and now it's evolving again to being the trusted partner for AI safety. And as you know, as AI models are becoming very capable and they're being used in all walks of our life, including healthcare and other things where you want to be really careful, you don't want the models uh, to be untrusted, you don't want the models to un be unsafe, you don't want models to kind of violate any regulations, like NIST just brought out there our own regulations in the US and we have similar from EU and Singapore and UK. So this is the new charter for uh, ML Commons and I'm really uh, proud to see this organization uh, you know, morph from a small group of uh, 20 odd people in 2018 because I was, I've been part of that, been a board observer since then and I'm really excited to see this new phase of ML Commons. Debo, congrats to you and the team. That is Thank you. very exciting. It's and all ex about the team, right team. Yeah. Yes, <laughs> it is all about the right team. We know about that. Shout out to our team here yeah. while we're on that note. I, I am going to bring it back to you a minute. So you, you all on this stage have talked about making it easier. Everybody always sure. wants to make everything easier. But why is it so hard? Uh, it's, it's a great question. We'll answer it from two different perspectives. I'll give mm -hmm. you more of the business side. Uh, Shaked can go into the inner aspects, Excellent. but it's it's really it's a two problem or it's a it's a two persona problem that we're trying to address. One of them is the operator. The operator needs to be able to operate as fast as it can. It all comes down to <coughs> the ability to abstract away. Uh, the the business logic of what they're mm -hmm. trying to get across and automate it in a yeah. way that's uh, uh, with least toil as possible, get into the hands of the end user, and the end user needs to know how to interact with it right. in a way that's bi-directional. If they have any issues, it's not just like going and filling in a form or a ticket and going back into a queue. They need to be yeah. able to have feedback, uh, the feedback loop. So if you're approaching it from both different directions, there's different challenges for each. It's it's abstracting away all the complexity, everything we just uh, shook it was noise. about. The noise. It seems like there's a lot. Abstracting away all the complexity and making it as simple as a chat GPT call, even though it's clearly not. Right. <laughs> That's the beauty of it. If you can make it seem so simple that your user says, oh, I can do this, you've arrived. Because that's how easy mm -hmm. it should appear to that user. Now, never mind all the different models and different provisioning, all the different complexity behind the scenes, that's seamless to the users. And, and that's the beauty of how to, to do it, but, but it's a lot harder than it appears. And maybe yeah. Shaked can get into that a little yeah, bit. Tell us, yeah, tell us how you wave that magic wand and make that so yeah. much less noisy. Oh, I would love to. Um, so when coming to an enterprise, when trying to adapt 
um, LLM based uh, processes um, which are essentially by their nature DevOps which is by itself very complex and they, as I mentioned before there's a lot of ways uh, um, to get uh, such processes up and running and joining to what Amit said before the time to automation uh, element is what uh, basically uh, uh, makes the paradox of not, no, not doing that, right? If I deal with mm -hmm. a task on a weekly basis, uh, me or, or my team, and now um, um, this task will repeat itself, I would want, I really want to automate it, but if it will take me more than a few minutes, most likely I won't be doing that. So the idea is to give the flexibility um, to really easy, uh, just define what you want, understand the organizational context, right? which infrastructure components I have inside the organization, who owns what, um, um, which processes are adapted already, um, um, all of this uh, communication that needs to be done internally in the organization, um, and of course, uh, the infrastructure elements, right? Being able to trust it would require, essentially, in a lot of cases, for it to run on your infrastructure. So there's the inferencing layer, right? The ability for the LLM to live on my infrastructure maybe serving uh, some LAMA fine-tuned code uh, that I would want, uh, fine-tuned model, sorry, that I would want to consume by my LLM processes, but my LLM processes in the end will run something. They will interact with some system. They will go to AWS, they will go to Okta, they will talk with those platforms. And now you need to think how it's going to run. Uh, is it a service account? Is it like um, API credentials? How do I deal with secrets? Um, how do I deal with... Um, um, serverless orchestration, I wouldn't want to save the state. All of these complexities is something that we learned um, um, right from the beginning, even before uh, trying to solve the problem of LLM joining to the kitchen, because the kitchen was still the same kitchen, right? We now just want to make another dessert, and this dessert requires, uh, you know, a lot of thinking, and you need to go through this way to understand essentially how things should be combined. So DevOps, in the end, um, they don't really mind about LLM. They, would, they might be impressed by it. Uh, they, want, they might do some cool scripts that will use function calling. But understanding the all end-to-end -end complexity and abstraction layer is something that they would prefer to use a platform um, that offers them the solution to actually define it in the same way they're doing today. Same concepts. Yeah. We allow you to essentially define your LLM complex processes, DevOps processes, as code, concept that proved itself already. So that's essentially the way that we're looking on it. And when you're looking on it this way, and you're saying, I'm using code, you can now use LLMs, which are special at code generation, to essentially get this code, right, uh, based on, let's say, a description of, uh, of a user statement, like Amit was mentioning, but the outcome is expected. It's all structured. It's not, um, you know, hallucinations. Maybe it will not run, run the correct function. All of these obstacles that you're facing when dealing with LLMs. Yeah. That was very well articulated. Thank you both, actually. And it, yeah, you, you nailed it. <laughs> <laughs> we'll have you back on the show again. Yeah. That was good. Oh, yeah. oh, yeah. yeah. <laughs> Good outcome. Yeah, but I, but I think, again, you, you're all hitting on kind mm -hmm. of a, a thing, which is there's so many moving parts oh, yeah. here. And most organizations aren't well staffed to be able to deal with deploying of LLMs and the infrastructure to support it and you, you know. And that experience has to be the same. I mean, yeah. to, it came back to the developer experience right there. What you're saying is they want to be familiar with it. It's less, I mean, yeah, there's bells and whistles and some things that look exciting right now as we enter this, this new era of application with AI, but it can't be some crazy clunkier, I need 17 more people on my staff. I mean, heck, your staff is 17 right now. Oh, uh, that, yeah. You know, yeah. I, that says a lot. Yeah, and, and, and again, in the data that we see, it's also a, to your, both your points here was that it's a hybrid nature. It's the hybrid nature of that data, the hybrid nature of that infrastructure. Right. Do, you, do you see in, your or, in the organizations you talk to is that, hey, they're, you know, again, even though maybe the economy is not the best all over the place, oh, yeah. but they see that, hey, we have to do more with the people we have here today and leveraging the data that we have here. I mean, still, there's, I, in our data that we pulled, there's still a ton of data for instance, in Microsoft SQL, all over sure. the place. I mean, oh my still, gosh! It's oh, still yeah. the you most. Want to talk about legacy uh, data? It's uh, yes. everywhere. Uh, and yeah. So when you start, to I just shivered actually, <laughs> just thinking about old SQL <laughs> queries from <laughs> ten years ago. When you, when you guys look at this and you talk to these organizations, 
what kind of you know bringing it back to how people should look at going forward what should they be thinking about what should they be planning for in looking for automation looking for things that make their life easier. Mm -hmm. We can go uh, right here. Yeah, sure, I'll go around the horn. Yeah. <laughs> the first part, part you correctly mentioned, it's optimization of the of the headcount and the resource you have. Uh, think about the human paired um, coding. This is human paired operations, right? It's, it's ability to have essentially another colleague by your side uh, operating side by side with you without really needing to be in the loop at the whole time. That's kind of the difference between the co-pilot approach and the agentic framework we discussed. The second piece of it is business continuity. It's absorbing that tribal knowledge that the organization is trying to instill so that one day if somebody moves on to their next opportunity or is on PTO and that process is still a critical point of failure, there's a process that can go on even to, to outlive that individual in the organization. Yeah, yeah. Uh, Debo, from your last, last thought from your side. So I think um, as uh, enterprises want to use AI to make them more efficient, they need to think holistically about this AI strategy, their MLOps and DevOps strategy. But I think there are two different personas. So the first persona is the chief AI officer who has to figure out what are the use cases, what are the projects, what are the models, what are the technology stack, and then uh, they have to work very closely with the CTO and CIO to make sure that it's put into production efficiently with the right costs and the governance. So I think it's a two-pronged thing that I, we expect um, our enterprise customers to do. And, 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 and uh, the tying, uh, you know, the glue uh, to get, I mean, gluing this together is basically data people have to be very careful about their data governance and their model governance. So now the, it's a two-pronged thing. And by data, I mean the original data in databases mm -hmm, and servers mm -hmm. and object stores and filers. Sure. And also the embedded data, the data that's generated out of embedding, um, the original data ready for training models. And then you have to look at um, models, as you mentioned, like Llama 3 and all that. And then how do you ensure you, these models are aligned and safe, ready for uh, consumption of their customers. So it's a holistic view of how we see enterprises going about doing the both AI and data uh, across multiple clouds. Yeah, no, I, I think again, this, is, this has been great. I, I think again, it gives a, a view from the developer all the way down to the infrastructure and how important the different pieces play together because if you miss anything in those cogs, you know, any connection in there you can either end up with more expense, you know, bad things happen where deployments happen and <laughs> things crash, <laughs> or you have bad outcomes and people just don't like their LLMs and you get, you have to go back and you're not getting the ROI. So I want to thank you all for being on board. Thank you. Especially thank you, Savannah, for helping thank me you. My shepherd pleasure, this through here. Rob, this yes. is a joy. Uh, oh, <laughs> you all real smart. We'll keep you around. Yes, you passed absolutely. the test. We'll, we'll have you back. <laughs> and, and we'll also have you back for our next section here at SuperCloud 7. Stay tuned, we'll be right back.